Good morning. Is this working? Yep. Morning, everyone. Give everyone a moment to take their seats. I'm Robert Lieberman. I'm the provost of the university, and I am thrilled to welcome everyone to this, our second Science of Learning Symposium. Um, I'm pleased to be even a small part uh, of this important event, and I'm honored to welcome all of you to Johns Hopkins, to Hudson Hall here on the Homewood campus. Uh, my responsibility this morning is relatively light, um, which is good since it's, you know, first thing in the morning, you're just having your coffee and getting revved up. Um, but that's as it should be, since there's an extraordinary amount of talent um, gathered here to do um, for some very important work. And I want to get through my part of the proceedings as quickly as possible to make way for the substantive part of the day. I've been asked to provide a little bit of background on the Science of Learning Institute, the organization that's convened us here um, today. Um, why, for, why did we elect to create this institute, which is, I think, the fir among the first of its kind um, in the higher education universe? What's the vision and what's the mission here and what kind of extraordinary work um, is being done? Um, as with many things in the academy, this one begins partly with um, an idea, with a kernel of an idea, but also partly with uh, money. Um, as part of our seven-year, now uh, $4.5 billion rising to the challenge uh, campaign, which we're more than halfway through, um, uh, gratefully accepting pledges, um, to support our students, our faculty, our clinicians in their work to improve our city and our world through the work of our university, we identified a number of points of substantive focus. And this was really, we thought, an innovative and exciting way to express the goals of a campaign. If you think about university campaigns, often they focus on building buildings um, and the sort of mundane uh, uh, parts of running a university. We decided that um, it was uh, really an exciting opportunity to use a campaign to express a set of critical values and to push forward a set of critical and um, innovative intellectual pathways that drew on the best and, and, and most um, um, exciting parts of our university from all around uh, Johns Hopkins and, and, and convene around a set of intellectual priorities. Um, and the priorities that we're, we're still currently working on as part of our campaign are um, individualized health, um, the area of precision medicine and what we can do bringing together data science and clinical, clinical medicine and research, the future of cities in an initiative called the 21st Century City Initiative, global health, which is something that Johns Hopkins has long been associated with and is um, indisputably a leader in, and the science of learning. We call these our signature initiatives. And while each obviously takes on a different issue, they all take a fundamentally similar approach to their work, an approach that emphasizes cross-disciplinary collaboration around what is, from drawing from what is an extremely decentralized and geographically dispersed um, institution. Let me back up a little bit and provide a bit of context about our commitment at Johns Hopkins to promoting cross-disciplinary research and scholarship. Johns Hopkins was, as, um, uh, as many of you know, um, those of you who live here have heard this a thousand times, um, but it, that doesn't make it any less true, we were the first research university in the United States. Our predecessors here in Baltimore really um, invented in the United States the departmentalized university. Um, in my own area of the so areas of the social sciences, Johns Hopkins was the first university that had separate departments of political science and sociology and history and economics and anthropology, defining these as individual fields with their own means of acquiring knowledge and learning about the world, um, and their own professional standards for training graduate students and perpetuating uh, the line of, of scholarship. Um, this approach, of course, became the standard for uh, departments of, for institutions of higher education um, around the country. And as a very direct result, 20th century American universities um, 
adopted this departmentalized approach and have never been, have been, are, remain unmatched as, um, as educators, as developers, as promoters of new knowledge and new research. All of that accomplished and all of that said, uh, the 21st century uh, presents us with new challenges that are no longer amenable to the kind of, um, of solutions of research pathways um, and of knowledge that are confined to disciplinary, the, di the disciplinary furrows in which most of us in the academy have been accustomed to work. The problems such as global health, such as um, challenges of American and global cities, and such as the science of learning and understanding the roots of the science of learning and the applications of new knowledge, all of those kinds of challenges, the things that most excite our faculty and students, require cross-disciplinary approaches, require cross-fertilization of people trained in different disciplines. And we needed to find a way um, in the true innovative Johns Hopkins spirit to galvanize that kind of collaboration. <clears throat> so this isn't just about removing barriers. Everyone in, in this room, everyone at their home institutions, every university uh, that I know of is strug struggling with the problem of removing barriers. But success in these endeavors, <clears throat> excuse me, also depends on fostering and institutionalizing ongoing and deep interaction among scholars enabling them to us to cross-pollinate, so to speak, and spur discovery. And we focus uh, this, on this goal under the rubric of one university. This is a university, as many of you know, that's famously decentralized. Um, 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 but we are trying to build one university around these themes, like the science of learning. Here at the Science of Learning Institute, that goal is not being merely fulfilled it's being, I'm thrilled to say, it's being exceeded. Um, that's remarkable uh, for a number of reasons. One is that we all have exceedingly high expectations uh, and standards, and another, uh, another being that the institution, institute hasn't been in business uh, for that long. This very month, the institute is marking just its three-year anniversary. Um, and of course, the years of its existence don't tell the whole story. It took, a, as with all endeavors like this, it took a couple of years to lay groundwork, um, lots of thought and care went into building this, um, and it required an enormous amount of collaboration, pulling scholars from, uh, from around the university, from the School of Arts and Sciences, the School of Education, the School of Medicine, the Whiting School of Engineering, the Bloomberg School of Public Health, the Applied Physics Lab, the Kennedy Krieger Institute, um, and for those of you who are not from Johns Hopkins, that means bringing people together who can't just walk across a hallway or even across a quad to find each other, but sometimes traveling um, across town or, or dozens of miles outside of Baltimore to bring people together to collaborate. This, this level of collaboration is not easy when people are so far flung and you know have day jobs also um, uh, that they're supposed to fulfill. Uh, many of the people responsible for this effort are in this room, um, and uh, without belaboring a long list of people, I want to thank everyone who's been involved in building the Science of Learning Institute for their dedication, their effort, um, and their success. Um, the Institute's objective is to solve, uh, to address and to solve critical lifelong learning issues of the 21st century. Our scholars and researchers, researchers and students aren't focused exclusively on any discrete phase of life or any simple, specific type of learner. The work that you do covers cradle through career and beyond, challenged learners through the most gifted everywhere on the spectrum, no matter how you slice it. Our scholars, our researchers are striving to understand and to optimize human ability uh, uh, to learn by conducting cutting edge research, training others in the field, and connecting science to practice. More than 500 scholars, researchers, students from around the university are now associated with the Science of Learning Institute. That's a lot of talent focused on issues truly worthy of that level of commitment um, and an enormous uh, commitment from um, the builders of the Institute. Um, and I especially want to salute Barbara Landau, who's devoted herself tirelessly for the last few years um, to putting this all together and to leading us um, through this exercise. Um, 
Um, let me be a little bit more specific about what the Institute uh, is up to um, in my final minute or two. Work is, is well underway on questions that you all can, can um, elaborate more, uh, more uh, fully and, 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 and articulately than I, but on a range of questions, just of, of bewildering complexity, um, such as does learning or do, does learning of various kinds begin before birth? How do we learn to um, separate signal from noise, ignore irrelevant information and understand what we really need to understand in order to make our way through the world? How does the science of the brain support the creation of knowledge, the creation of memories, the creation of, uh, of, of the, the capacity to learn and the capacity to make our way um, uh, through an increasingly bewildering world? What are the molecular changes or cellular level changes that promote um, um, processes like learning, uh, memory, um, that, uh, that affect us as we age? Um, there are any number of questions that can come under this rubric, and people in this room and beyond here at Johns Hopkins in the Science of Learning Institute are not only um, tackling all of them, but trying to understand how they're connected to each other to build a comprehensive science of learning. As an educator, as an academic leader, I couldn't be more excited by the potential and the prospects of all of the work that you do, whether you're part of the Johns Hopkins uh, family um, or here visiting from another institution and by extension, part of the Johns Hopkins Science of Learning family. Um, there's no more important human endeavor than understanding learning and those who dedicate their lives to this uh, fundamental challenge are imparting, to imparting to, and maximizing it, are important to us here at the university and to people all around the globe. It's, it's, it's impossible for me to overstate my appreciation and enthusiasm for you, your leadership, and your scholarship. I'm gonna close um, with a couple of lines, um, some of which you're probably familiar with. Um, uh, but some of which you, but, but then follow this on through uh, the end of, of the poem um, to lines you may be less familiar with. Um, of course, it's entirely uh, in keeping with the spirit of cross-disciplinary uh, scholarship to talk about, uh, to quote poetry um, at a symposium on science. Um, the English poet Alexander Pope in the 18th century famously wrote, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. Um, I, I suspect that more than a few of you, I suspect we're familiar with at least some bastardized version of that quotation, and I suspect that more than a few of you um, might take issue with this uh, observation, perhaps something along the lines of the following. Well, learning has really nothing to do with drinking deep or uh, any kind of metaphor like that, but rather the functioning of fill in some part of the brain that I've probably never heard of. Um, but a few lines later, in this, uh, in this poem, Pope says something uh, perhaps more accurate and perhaps that more uh, closely captures the spirit of what we're about. He writes, while from the bounded level of our mind, short views we take, nor see the lengths behind, but more advanced, behold with strange surprise, new distant scenes of endless science rise. So even Alexander Pope in the 18th century understood the connection between the, uh, the, what was at that time the new science of understand, the understanding of, of human uh, capacity um, and its connection with the human ability to learn and to understand our experience with the world. And uh, that um, is, I think, the best way to capture what we're about here at Johns Hopkins at the Science of Learning Institute and what I hope you will accomplish over the next day. Again, thank you all for being here. Welcome to Johns Hopkins. Thank you for taking part in this event, to dedicating yourselves to creating new knowledge and for bringing us those new distant scenes of endless science. So I wish you a marvelous day. I will um, absent myself for most of the day, but I'll see you again at dinner. Have a great day and welcome again. Thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Barbara Landau. I'm director of the Science of Learning Institute. And uh, first I wanna thank our provost for his comments and also for the tremendous support that he uh, and the president have, have uh, provided and, 
and uh, uh, given to us for many years now in, in developing uh, the Institute. Um, I, I'm looking around the room and seeing not 600 people, but I want you to know that we have 600 people registered for this event. Um, a number of them, perhaps as many as 100, are logging in from elsewhere. Um, last time we had people from around the world, and I suspect the same is true this time. Um, we know that there are people waiting in line to get into the parking lot. Um, so <laughs> that's an indicator that um, we've got really quite a large audience, which is wonderful. Um, I want to give you just a tiny bit of background. I'm going to be very brief so we can jump into the first talk. Um, but as Rob said, um, we were launched in 2012. Um, and our first symposium was in um, uh, 2014. This is the second biennial symposium. Um, mission and goals are just um, uh, stated out here. It's to optimize, understand and optimize learning. And this is through doing uh, supporting cutting edge research, uh, training future learners, and connecting science to practice. Um, just a few fast facts about the Science of Learning Institute so far and the accomplishments that we, we've um, seen. One is that we have funded 21 seed grant proposals uh, across the university for a total of almost $3 million. Um, this is uh, uh, supported by um, an incredibly generous uh, philanthropist. Um, we, these seed grants have in turn generated uh, over $4.5 million in external funding. So again, the goal of providing seed grants in order to get innovative things starting started uh, so that people can then uh, go out and get um, funding from additional agencies has really been quite successful. Um, we've had many new collaborations, 51 new collaborations were formed by these grants because the grant proposals and uh, re proposal process required that people partner with somebody who uses a different approach. So these grant proposals and these research proposals are all involve people, multiple people with, uh, who have different uh, specialties. Uh, we started a Science of Learning Fellowship program last year. We have five distinguished Science of Learning Fellows. They're all in the audience. Um, uh, you can raise your hands if you feel like it right now, um, but otherwise you can, you can find them uh, around the coffee during the break. Um, and we've supported two translational science projects which are in progress and we're really proud of. One is called The Road to Reading and this is the process of bringing the science of language learning and literacy to children's museums in New York and in Baltimore. And the second is um, enhancing science curriculum, uh, especially st um, spatially infused science curricula for the Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, I want to now just turn to the thanks, the many thanks that I, I would like to give. I mean, there are so many people who have worked on this project and on the symposium down to the very last detail, and there are, as you can imagine, many, many details. Um, I first want to thank Dr. Kelly Fisher and Dr. Kristen Gagné and Mr. Mike Alexander, who I don't know if he's in the audience. He was out at the registration desk. They are the team in Science and Learning Institute who have done like an enormous job uh, organizing, planning this for the past nine months. Uh, the Gateway Sciences um, group, who has their symposium tomorrow but has partnered with us um, in a really, really um, very productive way. Um, my steering committee, our steering committee, the Science of Learning Steering Committee, which is composed of very distinguished faculty across the university, many of them are uh, here in the audience. They've done an enormous job in um, uh, working out the vision of the Science of Learning Institute and the process and so forth. Um, the Oversight Committee, which is composed of the deans of different divisions who are invested and involved in science of learning, many of them too are here in the audience. The president and the provost, and of course our generous philanthropists who really have uh, made all of this possible. Thank you.